My name is Imakile Ilibagiza and I grew up in Rwanda in a village called Mataba. My neighbors were great and beautiful people. Everybody cared for one another. Neighbors, if you, you fell asleep as a child, they put you to sleep in their, in their homes and they brought you back next day. I never heard any child who was ever missing. So my village was really beautiful. I, I, I keep great memories. My mom and dad were teachers. And I have three brothers who were four children. My faith is not something I can really tr even remember when it started. I don't remember one night in my family, we went to sleep without praying together. I, I grew up loved by not just my family, but you know, the, the village. My village was poor, but it was poor in a way that I didn't see it too much. I mean, we didn't have any person who was homeless. Everyone had a home, as simple as it was. So my village was really beautiful. I, I, I keep great memories. By the early 1990s, Rwanda had one of the highest population densities in Africa. This small country, with a largely agricultural economy, had a unique tribal character. About 85% of its population was Hutu. The rest were Tutsi, along with a small number of Batwa, Pygmy. All changed on April 6, 1994, as Rwandan President Juvenile Habi Ramana of the Hutu community returned from talks in neighboring Tanzania. His plane was shot down outside of the country's capital, Kigali, and the president was killed. I woke up in the morning. I still remember this image as if it was yesterday. My brother worked in my room. He had the jacket on and the belt tied, and he had a stick in his hand. My brother said, the president of the country died last night. They're going to kill us. The culprits were never conclusively identified. Some people blamed Hutu extremists, while others blamed leaders of Rwandi's Patriotic Front, RPF, consisting mostly of Tutsi refugees who invaded Rwanda from Uganda. The president's death sparked an organized campaign of violence against the Tutsi and moderate Hutu civilians across the country. In just hours, Hutu rebels surrounded the capital and took over the streets of Kigali. Within a day, the Hutus had successfully eliminated Rwanda's moderate leadership. As the weeks progressed, Tutsis and anyone suspected of having any ties to a Tutsi were killed. I went outside, we met our parents. I still remember my dad had on he just woke up from the bed. He had on a towel over his shoulders, like he's going to shower. And he had on radio. He's sitting on a chair. My mom is there. Two hours later, we heard BBC radio reported 18 families that were killed. Approximately 800,000 Tutsis and Hutu moderates were slaughtered in a carefully organized program of genocide over 100 days, making history as the quickest killing spree the world has ever seen. The Rwandan genocide is one of the heaviest moments in human history. I remember my father came and asked me to go to hide to a neighbor. And I remember as I was leaving, he handed me the rosary he had. That moment, I felt like he had so much more to say, but he didn't say it, but I can read it in his eyes, in his heart. And I felt like what my father was trying to tell me without saying a word was, we will never see each other again. But if you need anything, you know what to do. What I could have given you as a father, you will have to say the rosary. And you will have it. Directed by her father, Immaculate sought shelter at the home of a neighboring Protestant pastor. Although he was a Hutu, he welcomed Immaculate, a Tutsi. He hid her in a tiny bathroom in his bedroom, sliding a wardrobe against the bathroom door for extra security. We were six of us in the beginning. 
But later, the man brought two more women. Three by four feet. We are six, we can't fit. Now we have two more. At the time of the genocide, some powerful nations in the UN thought a small peacekeeping mission would result in a large and costly war. Due to the influence of these nations, the UN peacekeeping mission was recalled from Rwanda. The whole world saw what was happening in Rwanda, but most chose not to act against genocide. I had a lot of impatience. I had a lot of anger. Anger I never thought were possible. People who, this is my village. This is people my parents pay school for. Are they coming to kill us? Why? And the more I thought about it, I started to regret anybody I ever spoke to who was from the other tribe. It became a sickness because I even forgot that the man who was hiding me was a Hutu. So I'm hiding the whole tribe, and yet I am living through people from that tribe. But when we get angry, it becomes obsessive. I was becoming literally a prisoner out of my anger. But I thought, what do you do? And now another stage of my feelings I was thinking, I was feeling was the need to revenge. I had a headache out of anger. And the thing is, you are not done when you're angry and think about things you can do. I will think about, I will be a soldier, I will throw grenades all over the country. I fly planes and just like kill people. And I'm thinking about that, I felt like I did it. My heart will be beating faster out of this emotion. My blood will be running out of anger. And yet I felt good. That's what I'm supposed to do too. As if I did something good or I gave back anything. And you think about it, you start over and over, all day I'm thinking about the anger. What I will do, what I will do. And I stop and I go back again, what I will do. I'm like, I'm tired. I am tired being angry, but I don't know what to do. Because my brothers are not here, I'm going to be the hero one and revenge my family. But it was obsessive. It became like something I had to go through, sweating, angry, sweating, angry. I couldn't remember how to smile. Meanwhile, a UN peacekeeping operation was sent to Rwanda, but ill-equipped, it failed its mission. It didn't take long. They gave order, because they finished people in public. Then they gave order to start searching home by home to see if anyone was hiding. You think it was bad to be in one place like that, but to know that somebody's going to come to hunt for you, it was the worst I've known. There was pain. I remember the day they came to search for us. I was stretching and I saw this tiny, in through this tiny window of the bathroom, something I thought was like a thousand people. But they were actually three to four hundred. Men from my village, they came inside the house and started to search everywhere. I felt like a thousand needles were going through my body. They were not touching me, they were not killing me yet. And yet I felt like I was dying. I wish to die and end it. And I remember on one shoulder, I felt as if a voice was telling me, open the door, end the torture. They're going to find you anyway. Why wait? And I really just wanted to open the door. And however, there was another voice in me and something much nicer was telling me, do not open the door, ask God to help you. And I remember in a split of a second, turning to the nicer voice and asking God, I am begging you, please don't let them find us today. If they don't find us today, I promise you, I will never doubt my faith again. Even if things go bad, I will still know you are there. Even if they open it tomorrow, but at least I would know there is heaven for sure. A big number went around the house to make sure no one jumps out of the window. Another number went in every room, under the beds, in the closets. They even opened suitcases to make sure there was no babies hiding. They went on the roof of the house to make sure no one was laying there. At last, they came right to the door of the bathroom. The man told us, before one of the killers touched the handle, he did, before he pulled, he told the man, you know what, we trust you. You are one of us. You cannot hide these bad people. You are a good man. And he turned around and he left. When I heard that, what shocked me was not, 
great, we are saved. What shocked me was, oh my God, God is real. It was a time I told God, I believe in you now 100%. Just please protect my faith. I never had to go through anything like this to, to doubt you. Taking to the radio, rebel Hutus called the Tutsis cockroaches and urged their fellow tribesmen to continue wiping out the Tutsi population. Listen to me, good people of Rwanda. Terrible news. It is true. Horrible news. Our great president is murdered by the Tutsi cockroaches. <laughs> it is time to clear the brush, good Hutus of Rwanda. They recommended focusing on the murder of children, the next generation. In this frenzy, Immaculate's entire family was killed. Sometimes I thought, send them to hell. Dear God, I love you. Kill them before they kill me. And I thought I was praying. But I remember when now I know God is there, I'm reading the Bible and I started to say the rosary. For the first time in 20 minutes, I said the rosary. I felt like I moved from the bathroom to a place of air. I felt peace for the first time. Because the words of this rosary that I put together, my job was only to think about the words, to think about which part to meditate on, not to make up words, kill them before they kill me, you know, take them away, take them to hell. No, I was forced to say, say our Father here, and say Hail Mary here and say glory be to the Father and to the Son and the Holy Spirit here. So I had to say words and I had to mean it because I love this prayer. And that when a huge transformation started. And then I started to remember, if I'm asking God to protect me in this bathroom, why can't I ask him to change my heart and make me forgive? I went on my knees and I put my hands up and I begged God, if you know how to forgive, help me out. I don't know how, how, but you can. You are God. I'm going to put it in your hands. You can, same way I'm asking to protect me here, I'm putting it in your hands. You can do it. I felt like luggage was lifted from my shoulders. In mid-May, the Security Council voted to send 5,000 troops back to Rwanda. However, by the time the force returned, the genocide had taken its horrific toll and had long since ended. After the genocide, I went to visit somebody whom I heard and I knew that have actually was a big part of killing my family. He had taken away staff from the house and um, the prison. The head of the jail was a friend of my father. So he asked me, he said, you come and see him, and if you want to hit him, don't worry, I'll protect you, you know? And that's what was expected. So, and we never forget, this man came from the corridor, a man who used to have a good job, beautiful family, kids my age, and uh, I would respect him as my father before. And he had hair upside down. He hadn't shaved in six months. I remember one feet was really swelling. He looked down, but with this kind of attitude of like, I don't care, I'm dead anyway. And when I saw him, the first thing that took me by surprise, I cried. I cried. The head of the jail is like, why are you crying? But what really was in my heart was, the compassion I, I had towards him. I'm like, you did this to you? It was such a moment I felt like Jesus was saying, you see what I told you? He could not love you if he can't love himself. He, he didn't know what he was doing. He's blinded by hatred, by selfishness. And that is what we all do. When we hate, when we are selfish, in the end we put ourselves in trouble. So we don't know what we are doing. And this was just the example of God was showing me. I did not have one bit of anger. It was done when I was in the bathroom, when I was um, struggling to understand if I should forgive or not. That when my anger was gone. But there, I only had compassion towards him. And I remember I reached out to him. I knew he was just like, I don't care. I reached out to him and told him I forgave him. The 
the moment touched me, especially because of the head of the jail. He was really mad. This man have lost five children and his wife. So all he wanted was to revenge his family. And he was head of the jail, so he knew how to do it in a sneaky way, maybe. So what he told me, he was mad. He's like, how can you? You forgot what they did to us. How can you forgive him? Like, I brought you to hit him. Now this word, you, you give him a gift? I'm like, OK, I can't explain. A year later, the head of the jail came to me, where I found a job at the UN, United Nations, and he came to visit me. I told him, I said, I'm so sorry. I know that time I wasn't sensitive to your own suffering. He said, no, I came to thank you. I'm like, you thank me? What happened? He said, that day, when you forgave the man, it took me by surprise. I didn't expect. I have never seen anything like that. It took me by surprise. And he said, I was like, how can she? And he told me he used to beat them every evening. He would go home, come back next day with more anger. And evening when he beat them, he felt better. But he said, after he forgave them, I went home and I started to think, maybe I can. And if I do, how can I? And he said he started to talk to them. And instead of beating them, he would ask them questions. Why did you do it? How can you do that? Who did you kill? And the more they talked to him, and some of them were crying, he started to realize there's a human part in them. It's not all lost. And he forgave too. And the man came to tell me, he said, I have decided to revenge my family all my life until that day you came in. Now, because I was able to let go of the anger, I met somebody and I'm going to get married too and start a new life. So that what he came to tell me, like, it was like God was saying, don't hide it that you forgive somebody. Forgiveness is better and is stronger. Love is stronger. Hope is stronger. The virtues, all the good things, they are stronger and they bear better fruits, more fruits than hatred. So like, don't hide it. Don't be ashamed of your forgiveness. Jesus said, go out to the whole world and announce the good news. And that's what Shalom is doing. It's bringing the good news of the Holy Spirit in action, renewing the face of the earth so that all people may know how good is the Lord, how beautiful is the work of salvation. Thank you, Shalom, for all you do to reach out, to lead the faith forward. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Shalom World, God's own channel.